I wanted to ask you, uh, how did you get started in making films before Carnival of Souls? How many films exactly had you made? <laughs> exactly. I'm not very sure about how many I had made before Carnival. I got started making films. Uh, I was here at the university in the theatrical department, in the theater department up here, uh, as an instructor at that time. And uh, I would come down to Centron once in a while as an actor. And finally they asked me if I would like to direct for them. And I said, sure, it would be kind of fun to try. So I came down full time as a director at that time. And that was 12, 13 years before we did Carnival. What prompted you to make Carnival Souls? I think everybody that makes motion pictures sooner or later wants to try a feature film. I think this is uh, just sort of innate in the occupation. I think when you direct films, you want to see how well you can do the entertainment media. And so that's what made me want to give it a try. Uh -huh. And where did the, the idea for Carnival stem from? Went on vacation out in California, and on the way back I passed Salt Air, which is the amusement pavilion out in near Salt Lake City, Utah. Mm -hmm. As I went by, it was sunset, and the whole place uh, well, it looked very weird, and I thought, gee, it's kind of an interesting location. I ought to go take a look at it. So I stopped on the highway and went down and took a look at the place and decided then that if at all possible, a film should be made that uses this as a location. I just cataloged it away. Actually, I do that on a lot of films. You, you look at a place and you think, gee, if I ever need this, this is a good location for this. I'd kind of like to speculate on kind of what on the, some of the film's internal meaning, or so to speak. Uh, the fact that you had uh, your, your lead character, Mary Henry, was actually a woman who died, but at the same time she had never really lived. Uh, could you speculate on that a little bit? The basic concept was that, uh, like poltergeist, the, the fact that there is the possibility of energy coming out in a three-dimensional form in this particular case, Mary Henry uh, had never lived in her life before, and perhaps that's one of the weaknesses of the show, that we don't show Mary Henry enough before this event takes place. But anyway, um, the author and I assumed that Mary Henry had never really been much of a liver in the sense of doing a lot of things or enjoying life. So when she went off the bridge with the other two girls, she was not ready to die. She hadn't lived that much and had a terrific uh, fight to stay alive and then such became what amounts to a poltergeist or a recreation of matter in energy form and existed for a period of time in that form until finally death keeps calling her back and finally at the end gets her back. Um, in the budget, uh, Carnival Souls, what exactly was the budget for the film and uh, how did you raise the money? The budget for Carnival of Souls was $30,000, of which $13,000 was cash. A friend of mine here in town told me that he would be very happy to help me if I decided to make the film. So I called him up and said, we have a script, we're ready to go, and he said, I'm ready to get the money. So he contacted some friends and they came up with 13000 over the weekend. And so the next Monday we decided that we could make it by having deferred payments for certain members of the cast and certain members of the crew. And that's the way we went about it. You had some uh, interesting stories before on some of the location shooting. Uh such as the bridge scene. Uh, could you kind of recreate that? Okay, yeah, there were several interesting things that happened during the production. Uh, for instance, uh, we wanted to shoot a car going off a bridge out between Lecompton and Perry, Kansas. And I went over and checked on the bridge and came back to Douglas County and said that we would like to film a scene of the car going through the bridge. And Douglas County said, if you can get the permission of Jefferson County, uh, we'd be interested in doing this because it's jointly owned between Jefferson and Douglas. So I went to Jefferson and said, I have Douglas's permission, can I have yours? And they said, well, yes. And so then I went back to Douglas and said, I had Jefferson's permission, do I have yours? And they said, yes. The only hitch being that you had to pay for any damage you did to the bridge. And of course, this concerned me greatly because I thought, well, this could amount to a considerable amount of money, almost the whole budget of the film, if something happened to the bridge. Uh, but everything worked all right the day of shooting. The car, the first attempt, the car went through the bridge and everything was fine. Uh, the only thing was that when we finished that, I looked down and there's a six inch gas pipe that was right under the steel member that we put the car over. And had something drug on that gas pipe and punctured the gas pipe, we would really have had a time. Uh, when we left, the two men were there from the county preparing the bridge and about two weeks later I got a bill for $12 
for two befores and four befores that had been used in repairing the bridge in the two men's time. In writing the script, uh, were there any problems, uh, anything you were faced with? Actually, uh, I'm less aware of this, of course, than the writer himself, John Clifford. Uh, with John, what I did was come back and tell him of the location and some of the other locations I thought we could probably utilize well in the film. Uh, then together we talked about the general idea, but most of the ideas in the film belong to John, and through the time as he developed an outline and then finally a script, we decided we'd go that particular way. Yeah, I noticed a lot of uh, really interesting style and a lot of really, really flamboyant techniques in the film. Were you really influenced by any other films or any other uh, styles and techniques for that, or were you just kind of drawing on uh, your experience in industrial filmmaking? combination of all those things really. Uh, Cocteau, uh, I love his films, always have, and I would say that a great deal of the visual influence at that particular time would probably be due to films I've seen of his. Uh, Blood of the Poet, uh, several of his films, Beauty and the Beast, this sort of thing, uh, where in black and white you really get strong imagery and where you get sort of an ethereal sense of uh, the picture giving you a not of this earth type quality. Okay. Uh, did you find 35 millimeter production a hardship? Yes, uh, 35 millimeter was very different from working in the 16 medium uh, for two reasons primarily. First is the bulk of the equipment. At that time, the uh, 35 millimeter camera we used an airy blimped, and the blimped camera is probably about 30 inches long about 18 inches high and about 12 inches wide so you have this huge black box to move around to horse around every time you shoot a picture which limits you then on the the flow and the feel that you have of today's cinema which is very much handheld steady cam this kind of operation Okay. Uh, after the film was done and it was ready for distribution um, you ran into some problems uh, what was the I think anybody that produces a film runs into problems when they come to distribution for several reasons. One of them being uh, most of the time the film is not of the quality that uh, they normally do in Hollywood so as a result they can put you off a little bit saying uh, we're just not interested. Plus the fact that you now have the film in the can, they know that and you're sort of at their mercy. So you go and you say, could you please help me? And they say, well, we don't know if we want to or not. We don't know if we want this film. We don't know this. We don't know that. And also, you're novices in the field, and so you don't know what to ask for or what to do. Uh, my suggestion to other people making features would be, first of all, don't worry about pre-planning all your distribution. Go ahead and make the film, and then show it yourself in prime locations. Because on Carnival of Souls, had I shown it just in Lawrence, Kansas City and Salt Lake City, I would have been able to recoup all my expenses from those three locations. This would not have included foreign distribution or anything else. It was given to uh, Hertz Lion in California, a publicly owned distribution company, and we got reports saying it had made so much money here, so much money in foreign countries, and that we would be paid soon. Then Mr. Hertz, president of the company, took the money, disappeared, and that was the end of that. Hmm. Uh, the film was seen in Sweden and in New York. Uh, how did people react to it there? I know more about Sweden than I do New York, really. Uh, one of the ladies who was in the art department and in the uh, museum department here at KU was in Sweden when it was shown and brought me back a review. Uh, it was especially interesting because the Swedes are preoccupied with the concept of death. And the whole idea of Mary Henry coming back in sort of a limbo between life and death and they got all of this idea, while I read very few reviews in the United States that uh, said they got any of this. Hmm. Uh, do you know how the film, would, how people responded to it in the United States? The only way I can judge from that, of course, is from some of the reviews that were sent out. And in most cases, uh, they were saying that the, the picture looked very good, had some interesting ideas, and was a terrific amount of production for the budget. And the, the film seems to have uh, quite a bit of following. Would you say that it was because of the TV sales? And I think that's uh, probably the primary thing because uh, it has shown on late night TV now in New York and in Los Angeles. And as a result, uh, there are a lot of people who at that particular time of night can relax and sort of let themselves get in the mood of Carnival of Souls. Because it is uh, a film that you've kind of got to go out to in order to get something from. 
And as a result, we have developed sort of a cult following of people who really do like the ideas and do like the way it's presented. Looking back on the film now, uh, some years later, uh, would, would, there, would there be anything you'd like to change in the film? Oh, sure. I don't think anybody ever makes a film. But what you look back and think, uh, yeah, this could, could change and that could change. I think probably the primary thing I would change is, at times, the pace is laborsome. And I would still keep it a slow pace, but I would, there are some places in there where it's just too extended. And there are a few things that are too pat, like the doctor coming up to the girl and saying, my office is just across the street, why don't you come on over? A few things like that are a little too pat that we had to do just because of the way we were shooting and what happened. But uh, sure, I'd change things like that. How do you feel about those things now? I mean, they just seem... It's torture. You, uh, you know, anytime you watch something that you have done that you're not in agreement with, it's torture to watch it. Uh, a lot of the things that do work, you sit there and say, yeah, yeah, yeah. But then the others come and you say, hmm, no. <laughs> what do you plan on doing next? I, mean, uh, I don't know. Uh, John and I have got a couple of scripts. And uh, we don't know if we'll do these or not. John is retiring now from Centron and we just really don't know. Uh, we have, uh, we did a three-act play here in town with the community theater called Wabash Winning Streak. And this is a very interesting script, could be made into a motion picture. And we have another one that would be shot in Baldwin and Lawrence called Flanagan's Smoke that would be an interesting show to do in this locality. And what did you get out of making Carnival of Souls? Experience. Experience? No, got a lot. Of, it was it was enjoyable. The making process was enjoyable. The distribution process was torture. Mm -hmm. And in the final analysis, uh, right after the distribution failed, I had a terrific guilt feeling for all the people who had invested money in the film and weren't getting anything back out of it, and never did get anything back out of it. You feel responsible for that. Uh, but then gradually over time, that feeling wears off, and you sort of get back in harness and say, well, let's give it a try again. Because had Carnival gone at the time, had we received the money that was due us, we could have gotten right back into another production and then another production, because all you have to do is have three or four of these, and then the royalties from the films will keep a company like that going. Okay. I think that's all we need. Thank you. Thank you.